Good morning, sir. Can you tell me your name and your profession? My name is Richard Pyle. I'm a retired correspondent for the Associated Press. Uh, so you have such a long career in uh, the press. Can you tell us, the, do you uh, have some experience with the Vietnam War? Yes, I covered the Vietnam War for five years, from 1968 to 1973. I was based in Saigon, in the Associated Press Bureau there. Um, and I was, uh, for three of those years, the last three, I was the bureau chief. Wonderful. Uh, uh, so uh, how many of uh, uh, reporter, photographer, from America come to Vietnam to cover the war, you remember? Well, I don't, over the years, uh, from 1962 to 1975, basically, there were hundreds. And uh, the press corps in Saigon changed in size uh, periodically, depending on the crisis that was going on. During quiet periods, it would be smaller, and then when, when uh, something would happen, some crisis would occur, the war would, would uh, get worse. Uh, there would be a lot of visiting correspondents would come in. So it could be as many as 400 at one time. And at, at, the, at the basic level, probably around 200. But a lot of people who were correspondents, accredited journalists, were wives and technicians and people who weren't really doing any, any uh, serious reporting themselves. There were support staff and that kind of thing. And uh, one survey has shown that of all the journalists who were in Vietnam, only about one third of them ever went into the field and actually covered combat. Uh, so you uh, first came there as a reporter. Um, what kind of news you cover? Uh, how how you got uh, got picked to send to uh, uh, places? Can you tell? Well, uh, like like other bureaus, other news bureaus, there the Associated Press had a staff. We had a staff of about. 30 people altogether, which one third was news, one third was photos, one third was administration and, techni and te technicians. Uh, and we covered uh, the war itself every day. We had people in the field deployed around the country up in I Corps, northern part of South Vietnam. Uh, we had people that would go to the Delta on a regular basis, the Central Highlands, and the, all the areas around Saigon. So we covered it as thoroughly as we could with uh, words and photos. That was the whole, that was our job. That's what we did. Uh, so um, you were there in 1968. Uh, was you there at the time uh, they called Tet Offensive, which is the VC attack uh, many cities in the country, including Hue? Was you there at that time? I was, I was not in Vietnam at the time of the of Tet Offensive, which was January, February 68. I got there later. Uh, but of course, being a student of the war as well as a reporter, I know a lot about what happened there because a lot of the people whom I knew had been there at that time. So uh, we uh, um, research and study about the war uh, through uh, witness by interview Vietnamese American American um, soldier who fought there and also National Archive. Uh, one thing that uh, we found out and is still in the question a lot was um, you know, the news cover during that time cover a lot. Uh, uh, just like uh, in Saigon, Chilean area, there was a picture that uh, took by uh, Eddie Adams. Uh, yeah. uh, this was uh, General Luan who pointed a gun to a, uh, you know, a, a VC called Women Lamb and shoot him later. And that uh, picture very much uh, make uh, Vietnam War like a turning point. Um, you know, we won that battle for sure. Everybody have to admit that, but uh, after that we start losing the support from the public uh, and then uh, end up, you know, the uh, um, Congress uh, legislature, nobody support it anymore and, uh, you know, end by 1975 uh, without any uh, support uh, from American uh, in the last minutes. Uh, so my question uh, is, um, uh, why is that uh, the news didn't cover the part that massacre in Hue that killed over 5,000 Vietnamese civ civilians uh, and the, the communists came in the city with a list of people and I am having in my process 
that list, you know, uh, that provided to me by a colonel, colonel uh, American Marines, uh, he had that, mm -hmm. that list. Uh, and then we don't see that much uh, coverage in the American press about that. Can you tell? Well, uh, I can't answer the question as to why it wasn't uh, more widely publicized, but it was covered, and I know that because I covered it. Oh. I was there in 1969 when the bodies were discovered in a way, and uh, I was among several reporters. There were several reporters from AP, including myself, who in sequence went away and were up there and, and were witnessed the excavation of these, of these mass graves, which were out in the sand dunes. We saw the bodies being pulled out of the ground. We saw the fact that they had, in many cases, they had their hands wired behind them. They had been shot in the head and they were executed. Uh, so the stories about that happening are true. I don't know that the exact number, I don't remember the exact number of 5,000 uh, is as good a figure as I could offer, so I don't really know that. But I know it happened and I know that th it was covered by the press. Uh, what happened to the, uh, that coverage is another question. When we filed the stories uh, from Saigon to, to the, the world, uh, it was up to the newspapers and, and the other outlets to, to use this copy, this information. And uh, at that time, it was when the, uh, it was a year after the, uh, the fall of uh, Wei, or the Battle of Wei, I should say. It didn't fall, it was the Battle of Wei. And uh, I think that the public perception of the war was changing People in this country were getting tired of that war, and that might have been a factor. I don't really know that, but I'm just guessing that it might have been a factor in why there wasn't more attention given to that, because these were really, you know, by definition, atrocities. Uh, uh, people being executed and dumped in mass graves is an, is an atrocity against the rules of war, and uh, it could have received more attention than it did, probably, but it's not because it wasn't covered. Um, yes, we, we found a little bit in National Archive uh, footage uh, of people digging the mass grave, yeah. but that didn't buy, I think, the South Vietnamese, uh, you know, photographer or, you know, uh, I mean, uh, TV, um, video, uh, cameraman people, but not many from, uh, I think, covered there by many uh, unit of uh, American military yeah. and the press, uh, yeah. American press, but not many. Um, so to to the young generation of people like me, uh, we think that why is that uh, over five thousand uh, dead body of South Vietnam not uh, good and must at like uh, one person got shot in the uh, children? Uh, and uh, how how you explain that? I, well, I can explain that. So one way is that the the numbers, the picture of of General Wan shooting this guy in the head, was a stunning picture, which kind of encapsulated the whole story of Vietnam at that point for American the American people, the American leaders, uh, seeing that picture was, would shock anybody, uh, no matter who did it. Uh, the story of 5,000 people being executed in that manner by the other side uh, uh, didn't have the same impact because the numbers don't really mean anything to people. The number, number 5,000, is that a lot or is that not very many? Who knows? You, know, you, you have to make a judgment on that. Uh, but uh, there was no picture of the bodies or the excavation of the Hui graves that had the same kind of impact, dramatic impact, as, as the picture of the, of the one guy being executed. So even though the same thing was happening, uh, it just didn't have the same kind of visual impact that that one picture did, and that's probably why, uh, why people don't remember it as well, yeah. although it did happen. Well, uh, overall, what do you think about the Vietnam War in terms of uh, the involvement with American? We, uh, South Vietnam and American, we have a lot of, uh, I would say, advantage in terms of weapons and, I mean, uh, aid and all that. Uh, why didn't we, uh, I mean, win the war? Well, there's about a million reasons for that. Uh, I can't go through the whole million reasons, but uh, it's, a, it's a fact that in the beginning, uh, when the United States first got involved in Vietnam in the Kennedy administration and following him, the uh, Johnson and then Nixon, uh, in the beginning, uh, the American people were not sure where Vietnam was or what this was all about. Um, they didn't question it. And even the press that was covering Vietnam in the beginning, the American press, most of them didn't see any, didn't have any quarrel with the question of why the Americans were there. It seemed like a good idea. It was a 
it was in the context of the Cold War, East versus West, uh, Russian, uh, Chinese aggression against other countries. And Vietnam was seen generally as a, another potential victim of this, of this uh, East-West conflict. Uh, the Americans didn't want that to happen, so they interceded in Vietnam. American policy uh, wasn't very well handled in Washington because the American government didn't understand Vietnam very well, and their policy was badly conceived and it was badly executed. That seems to be the reason why it failed. In the end, it wasn't because uh, the Americans weren't uh, sufficient fighters or that kind of thing. It was nothing like that. Uh, it's been said that uh, the, uh, the the Americans in the South Vietnam won every battle uh, in the in the war. But an, a, an officer in Hanoi said uh, uh, that may be so, but it's irrelevant because they didn't win the war, and all these victories amounted up to to nothing in the end. So it was a matter of policy not being well planned and well executed, and uh, that's the way it turned out. So, so somebody said that yeah, you can win the battle, but you lost the war. That's the case of Vietnam. Basically. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, talking to about coverage again, uh, we uh, talk about uh, in American um, press and then you know media. Uh, we found a uh, good number of footage and article and material and book uh, wrote about um, meat line, you know. So they kill, uh, I mean, the, the, his name? Kelly. Kelly um, killed about over 100. Uh, and then they got the press blow over the world about that. And uh, he got killed about over 5,000 and got very little about it. So I'm talking about people like my generation and younger looking at it. And they, they're talking about the unfairly report from American press in Vietnam. What, how you you comment on that? Well, I'm not sure what I'm what, what what I'm commenting on here in this regard. Uh, the the Americans uh, committed an atrocity in Milai. They killed a bunch of people that shouldn't have been killed. Was, the assumption was that these were all Viet Cong, and most of them are just villagers, as it turned out. It was bad bad uh, decision making by soldiers in the field. This kind of thing happens in war. Uh, it happens, and in, in, uh, it's it's always regrettable. Uh, but it doesn't mean you have to condone it. In that case, it wasn't condoned. Some attempt to, to bring justice was made there. Uh, pretty difficult situation for the Americans because it was so embarrassing. It's not the sort of thing Americans are supposed to do. Uh, but they did it. And uh, the, the case justifiably was given a lot of attention because without that... I'm sorry. Because without that that attention given to it, uh, the suggestion would be that it was condoned and it would be it would happen again. Uh, but it, so it was it was appropriate that their investigation was conducted, and that, that people were punished to the extent that they were. A lot of people figured in this country they should have been punished more harshly. Uh, that's a judgment call. But uh, what happened happened, and uh, Eli went into the books as a as an atrocity committed by Americans, and it was what it was. What about the killing of over 5,000 people in uh, from North Vietnamese? Uh, are they need to be condemned too? Sure, but they weren't condemned the same way. The fact that they weren't, uh, is the reasons for that was, as I said before, people weren't reacting to mass numbers the way they were to a specific individual incident, which is much more dramatic and easier for people to understand. You see pictures of a few bodies laying in some ditches at my line. That's a, that's a picture that really is going to attract your eye. Uh, pictures from Hue uh, were not as dramatic and, and uh, they didn't have the same impact. I see. So the way you present it can make a difference? Well, of course you could. It wasn't necessarily by design that people covered anything up. They didn't do that. Nobody in the press covered up uh, what happened at Hue. It was reported. What happened to those reports when they got back to the States and to you know, Europe and elsewhere is another matter. As the reporter or the photographer on the job, on the story, you do what you do your best with this and then 
You take your chances, you don't know what's going to happen to it, what editors decide to do with it, whether it becomes part of a bigger story or whether it makes uh, headlines or not, is up to editors and people. It's beyond your control if you're the reporter. And I've had that experience happen many times in my life as a journalist, where I thought something was really important and the editor somewhere just didn't agree with me. I, uh, we interviewed Mr. Hao Biu, the one that uh, was in charge, uh, editor in charge of that time, and he said very much the same way that the picture of uh, Nick Wood, with, uh, I mean, took uh, Kim, uh, Miss uh, Kim, uh, Phuc uh, was running uh, because he got burned by um, Napalm uh, yeah. bomb, and then also uh, Eddie Adams, uh, he select those uh, picture. And uh, and everybody think that those picture make uh, different in Vietnam War. It uh, turned away. It, uh, how, how you comment that? Do you think that have a lot of impact on those pictures? I think there was there was three pictures in the war that really fall into this category that you're talking about. First one was the picture in 1963 of the of the monk who set committed suicide by fire in Saigon. That's the picture that got everybody's attention. The Americans looked saw that picture in their newspapers and. God, what's going on over there? What the hell is this? You know, I've never seen anything like that before. That picture was the one that really first drew a lot of Americans' attention to that there was a Vietnam and something was going on there and we were involved in it. Although the Americans weren't involved in that particular incident, yeah. it was designed to attract attention and it did. Yeah. Uh, that was a picture by Malcolm Brown of AP. The second picture was Eddie Adams' picture of the execution in 1968 during Tet. And the third picture was Nick Hood's picture of the napalm uh, girl, the so-called Kim Cook. Mm -hmm. And but none of these pictures, none of these pictures changed the war. People said, "Well, that ended the war." No, it didn't. War went on after Nick Hood's picture it was in 1972. The war went on for three more years, mm -hmm. so it couldn't have ended the war. It may have affected the public. Pers perception of what was going on in Vietnam. People were shocked by every one of those pictures. Were shocking because they were, you know, individuals, you know, in some terrible straits. Uh, dramatic photographs. But they did, after the initial shock or impact of those pictures, it didn't really change the outcome of the war, as people have suggested. It didn't happen. The war took its own course and it ended the way it did for other reasons. I see. As I said, the, the war ended the way it did be, for a lot of different reasons. Um, people got tired of the war. People in this country were tired of it. They thought, the, uh, a lot of people thought that the Americans had made a mistake by ever getting involved in Vietnam in the first place. And uh, um, they were, so they were tired of it, wanted everybody to come home, tired of people being killed and so forth. And uh, the American policy, uh, obviously was not succeeding in what it was attempting to do. Um, and people in this country also blamed the South Vietnamese themselves for not being strong enough or resolute enough to defend their own country. Uh, you can certainly make an argument that that's not true, that the South Vietnamese were very committed and involved in their own, in, in saving themselves from, from uh, being taken over by the North. Uh, but uh, overall it wasn't sufficient. And uh, in the end, uh, the whole thing failed because when, in 1975, when, it, when Hanoi made its final push south, an all-out offensive to take over the south, uh, they succeeded. There wasn't enough left in the American uh, uh, resolute arsenal to, the Americans had pretty much pulled out and no the combat forces had already left in the first place. And uh, the South Vietnamese made a valiant effort to to defend themselves, and they didn't have what it took to do it. Nobody was there to help them then. Yeah, some I interviewed some uh, individual, and they said that their tank didn't have enough gas, their yeah. gun ha didn't have enough bullet, because the, at that time, like you said, American already tired of the war, and then the last 700 million dollars would ask to have on, you know, ammunition, uh, ammunition and didn't happen. So they, uh, and all the supply get into the shore, but never get into the land to right. give it to them. So uh, 
uh, of course, uh, people in desperate um, time, they're thinking that Americans abandoned them. You, what do you have comment about it? Well, I won't comment on the suggestion that they were they abandoned Vietnam, but the, I know there's a strong uh, sense of that among many people that that's what happened. Congress was making the decisions. Uh, decisions in war can be made by generals, but those are tactical decisions. The, the decisions that really matter are the political decisions behind them, which make it possible for soldiers to fight and, and to, to, to do what they're supposed to do. So if there's any fault in that, the fault probably lies with the, uh, the political decisions in Washington much more than it, than it lay with the Americans or the South Vietnamese themselves. I mean, I, that's, I don't know how else to say that. Thank you, sir. And uh, um, you were, you said you tried to get back into the area during 1974, 75. You didn't succeed, but probably you have friends and, uh, you know. Uh, I heard that you tried to come back to the area, Vietnam area, um, uh, to cover the last day of the war, but you didn't succeed. But you have friends who are there, and of course, you, you know, exchange information. And um, uh, you, you didn't witness yourself the evacuation of the Vietnamese, uh, but uh, uh, you heard. And uh, uh, can you t uh, make some comment about about that? Well, my own feeling about wanting to go back was simply an emotional decision. I was based in Washington at that time. I'd been away from Vietnam for almost three years, and, and uh, when this happened, I felt sort of an obligation to, to, to go back. I wanted to go back and take part in covering the story of whatever was going to happen. I didn't know that Vietnam would fall or not. It wasn't evident right away. But it all happened so fast that I never got back. So I've always regretted the fact that I wasn't able to do that. Not that it matters to anybody except me. But uh, uh, the fall of Saigon was a, was a uh, uh, an event that was troubling to I think most of us who had spent time in Vietnam and got to know the Vietnamese uh, and understood uh, this was a country that was uh, uh, in a great deal of stress and turmoil and people were, were suffering a great deal from this war over the years. And so there was a, a strong element of sympathy on the part of many people in the press, people like me, uh, but that was about as far as it went. We weren't in the business of making accusations or blaming people for anything. It was just history happening. And our job was to cover history as it happened. That's what we did. And that was the only reason that I felt the impulse to want to go back because it was in a major historical thing and I wanted to be there for it. That was my job as a, as a journalist and somebody who cared about these things. Do you have any sense of regretting uh, anything that you want to do but you cannot do for South Vietnam or people who work with you in Vietnam? Uh, only in the sense that a, a few people uh, who people that got out got out of South Vietnam who wanted to that was a good thing I had no part in, in that but I welcomed them here I'm glad that they did that and the ones that chose not to come back uh, to stay took their chances and some of them suffered in the aftermath uh, and that as I, I'm sorry to, that that happened that the that decision didn't turn out for them but I've been back three times since this happened, since the war ended, and I've seen how these people have endured, the ones that we knew who stayed behind, have endured there and have tolerated a lot of privation and discomfort and political uh, repression. And there's p political repression in Vietnam today. There's problems with people being able to uh, speak their mind, uh, other things, which is expectable. But the most amazing thing about Vietnam today is that if you go to Saigon and look around, you wouldn't know this was a communist country. It looks like a booming economy. There's something deceptive in all that. It's not as good as it looks, but it's a very different thing than what people would have anticipated. Uh, so you have some friends or some people who work for you during Vietnam War who came to the U.S. Uh, in the time of you know, uh, looking for freedom. Uh, and uh, we build a community here today. At uh, we talk, uh, we speak is about you know almost two million Vietnamese American here, 
Uh, do you have any contact or you have anything uh, to say about this group of people? Yeah, I have, uh, I mean, in, have remained in touch with a number of them. Um, I think the Vietnamese who came here, uh, having been driven out of their country or having made the choice to leave uh, the country to come here, took a lot of risks. Uh, they made critical choices that nobody in their, in their life should really be expected to make. Uh, unless they choose to, uh, and uh, but like other immigrant groups that have come here, have built this country. The Vietnamese have done a, a wonderful job of assimilating, a combination of assimilating to American life and culture, but at the same time preserving their own culture, which is a very strong ancient culture, and it's really gratifying to someone like me to see this, that, that the Vietnamese, like all the other immigrant groups and communities that have come to the United States over the years, were able to come here and, and, and fit in and adapt and find their own place in American society. It's a great thing to see, and it's a, uh, it, it, just to see it happen, and to, uh, it, it, it takes away a lot of the, uh, uh, the bitterness that might otherwise exist in the minds of people who, uh, if they come here and hadn't been able to do that, it would have been a a very unfortunate situation. Yes. Uh, so, um, do you want to say anything about Vietnam War after the war and everything, uh, or even the community that uh, you want to say and I didn't ask you yet? No, I think you answered, you asked all the questions that I would be inclined to answer. <laughs> and uh, just that, uh, you know, for me and a lot of other journalists, uh, the Vietnam War came along at a time when we were in the business, the timing was right for, for it to be the, our big story. And we covered that. It's the biggest story that I ever covered in my life. I've been six wars, but none of them were like Vietnam. It was a life-changing experience to be there for five years and to have worked with all these journalists that, that we work with and to be amongst the Vietnamese in their own country, even in wartime. It was a, a very uh, uh, important uh, experience in the lives of all of us and especially in my own. So um, what do you want to tell the younger generation who uh, follow your footsteps or order before you uh, to become a journalist and cover all the ev big event in the world? Uh, what do you want to tell them uh, uh, from the Vietnam War experience? I would say that they would face the same kind of uh, uh, choices that, that I faced and others like me faced, uh, you had to uh, steal, uh, look at yourself and, and, and decide whether you wanted to take risks, whether it was worth it to do that. And I would recommend to anybody who thinks about this, uh, making choices of this type to cover a war, to go report a war, to tell what's going on in the world, the most important things that happen in, to the human race, take that chance, do it. Give it a shot, and uh, uh, it's a, it's in its own way. No, I won't say that. I can't say it's a rewarding experience. I, um, I just would I would say to these people, uh, take the risk. Do it. So between responsibility and uh, fame. How one can, I mean, to between them? Like, if you know that a news that can hurt people or get a bad result from it, and then you right there at the spot, you got to do it, and you know, how, how people can make choice between them? I mean, I don't know. I mean, news is news. It happens, whatever happens is news. If it's, if it's reported accurately, if it's reported fairly, uh, people are going to understand that, and uh, as a journalist, you have to stay away from uh, propagandizing. You have to stay away from expressing your opinion. Nobody cares about your opinion. They want to know what you saw and heard, and that's what you tell them. You don't necessarily have to tell them your own opinion. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs>